Let's go ahead. Okay, so we're in Hebrews um, chapter three. And like I just said a minute ago, this this is some one of the most exciting parts of the book of Hebrews. You know, obviously the book of Hebrews is just loaded with incredible teaching and so many helpful things. Uh, I I love chapter three and chapter four. I feel like they're such a amazing and 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 of course every chapter is amazing, but but I love this. So we're just gonna jump right on in um, and into ch uh, chapter three, verse one. He starts out saying, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Okay, so so uh, because these are short chapters, we're going to be able to take a little more in down in depth into line by line and a couple times even stop word by word. Uh, there's just there's so much here. So, um, you know, we start out and, 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 uh, remember, and you remember the general principle. Every time you see a therefore, you've got to stop and look at what's it there for. Right. And he's been making the argument of Jesus is greater than the prophets, greater than the angels. And he is. Uh, one who understands our struggles, his relatability, his understanding of our situation. He was made perfect in suffering. Okay, that's what we covered, chapter one, chapter two. And now he he kind of brings it to some action. And this is a pattern that we're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews. He'll make an argument, he'll take scripture, he'll break it down, then he'll apply it to us, and then therefore what we're supposed to do. So again, you always want to look at What's the therefore, therefore? So, so now he says, and he addresses us or the readers, and always in biblical study, you remember there's there's the direct audience, the people, the time, the place that the, that the writing was written to and sent to, but then there's the general audience. I'm going to ask everybody, make sure, please uh, have your, your yourself yeah. muted, because we're picking up some discussion in the background. Um uh, so there's the general audience, and then there's the, I would say, the universal audience. That's why it's kept, why it's in scripture, why it's recorded for all time, because it applies to all of us. And I love here, you know, he, it, there's so much teaching just kind of packed away in it. He says, holy brothers and sisters, you know, keeping in mind, this is a group of disciples under stress, under anxiety, under tension in danger. And he's Remind them they are the holy brothers and sisters. We are the people set aside by God. We are the people who have been called out of darkness. We are the people who are the holy nation, the people belonging to God. And again, that's just a reminder. Sometimes I think we forget that. Having our identity clear. Who are you? Who are you? That is so important. One of the spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines that I practice is called prayers of affirmation, where I just go through and I have I have different prayers of affirmation. You know, I am a son of God. I am a son of G. I, I am a, a disciple of Jesus. I am the Lord's beloved. I am the chosen child of God. I am the one Jesus died for. And these prayers help fortify our identity and create our reality. It's always important to stop and remember who we are. The titles the names given in scripture are very important because they form our identity. I think one of the biggest problems that can happen in the church is we just forget who we are. We forget who we are at work or at school or when there's problems. And we default to the humanistic or worldly way of being and thinking. And we get mad or we struggle with sin and stuff because we just we're not in tune with who we are. So that's always really important. And, and, and he's just slipping that in there, you know, holy brothers, sisters, people who've been called out, who share in the heavenly calling. 
You know, that's us. We that's that's us. We're the ones that have been picked. We're the chosen ones. And we've been called towards heaven. And that's who we are. I think even that, just knowing that, if you know that, if you remember that, if you believe that, it literally changes your life. It changes your reality. You see things very different. Things affect you emotionally very differently. It lowers anxiety. It lowers stress. It lowers worry and fear if you just have a solid understanding of who you are and where you're going. You've been called to heaven. That's where you're going. I mean, what a relief. And I, I remember there was a there was a classic uh, football game one time. I can't I remember even what season. It was probably like 10 years ago. And I had recorded it because the game was going to be played during church. And, and I remember even saying at church, don't anybody say anything about it. If you know, you know, if, if your phone says who won the game, don't say anything. So I said that literally in the service. And and I was all excited. I go rushing home so I could watch the recorded game. But then I saw all these cars with, you know, waving their Chargers flags and people honking and waving at each other. And it was like, oh, they must have won, you know. But I still went home and watched the game. And and but it was it was great. It was actually really enjoyable because when they would blow it, like I remember there was a play where LT was was almost about to cross the line and he dropped the ball right before. And it was like, no, but it wasn't that worrisome because that's all right. I know we're going to win, you know, so so it's OK. Go ahead. Fumble the ball. We'll recover. We'll get it back. And it's just so less stressful knowing already that we were going to win the game. And that's important for us as Christians. You need to know you're going to win. Yes, you're going to go through hard times. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. And you're going to fumble sometimes. But it's okay because we're going to win. So it puts things in perspective. And then the ultimate advice of doing this is the classic line, fix your thoughts on Jesus whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. I mean, I'll tell you right now, this is probably the most powerful piece of advice for living the Christian life right here, is learning to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Those of you in San Diego, and a number of you are in San Diego, you remember the year that we focused the church on Jesus. I remember announcing it, and people were looking at me like, Bro, we're a church. We're, we always have Jesus in our focus. No, we don't. No, we don't. We lose sight of Jesus. And we brought Kennard, Steve Kennard out. He did a whole weekend workshop on Jesus. We had 52 sermons on Jesus. We had quiet time packets on Jesus. We did all this kind of stuff. Because I know from experience, having turned around a number of churches, that this is always key. If you can get everybody fixed on Jesus, everything just begins to correct itself. Really, the Holy Spirit is able to correct things. And Jesus' is teaching and the Spirit of, the whole, uh, of God can correct us and get us back on track. But you have to fix your thoughts on Jesus. You've got to learn how to stay focused on Jesus. And that was a pivotal year for us in the San Diego Church. I just happened to bump into a video that we had made for ICLC Hot News of all the great things happening in the San Diego church and the turnaround story. And that, and, and, and I can tell you exactly when that the pivotal turning point was that year we focused on Jesus and incredible things happened. But that's also on a personal level. And that really started my conviction to do that started with my own personal change, my own personal turnaround. And so that's an incredibly important piece of us. In, in one sense, you could say that is what the whole book of Hebrews is, is fixing your eyes on Jesus. You know, I love the, the word. It's to perceive, to under, kataneo. Kataneo is to, to perceive, to understand, to apprehend, to grab it, to, to, to observe, to consider, to contemplate. I mean, it's like to really just have it on your mind and think about it, and, 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 and apply it, and, you know, what you see in Jesus, what he said to you, and if we can learn to do that in more and more situations, if we can learn to live a daily life like that, if we can learn to remember Jesus throughout the day, it changes everything. This 
is spiritual development. This is growing in the Lord. Is the better and better you get at keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, perceiving, understanding. Uh, one per, one commentator said it's it, the idea of that word is it's kind of like they didn't have staples in the ancient world, but it's kind of the idea of stapling something together. Like your 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 eyes are glued on it, you know. If you see an action movie, and 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 that's what I love about theaters because it's dark, and you put all your focus on something, and nobody's talking, nobody's walking in front of the screen, and you can't see it. It's just complete. Like you're able to fix yourself on it. That's what we're talking about here, and learning to live that way. And I don't mean at the expense of everything and everyone else, but just that you always got Jesus on your mind in your heart and when situations come up he's able to help you because he's right because you are aware i mean you know it, it's not that jesus leaves us but it's more that we leave jesus in our mind and in our hearts and and for many of us in the, for a large part of my life was i'd get up have a quiet time you know and that's where kind of where i check in and spend some time with jesus and then i run off to the day and i come back 24 hours later and check in with him again hey how about taking him with me? How about staying with him all day long? And so when these situations come up, when somebody cuts me off, when Michelle and I have a disagreement, or when the kids do something that really bothers me, he's right there to help me with it. And that's, that's a spiritual discipline. That's something we grow in. It's a lifelong pursuit, but it changes your life. And it is key to so many other things. So this statement, this encouragement. Remember, the book of Hebrews is the word of encouragement or the word of exhortation. Keep, learn to fix your eyes on Jesus. He says, he was faithful to the one who appointed him. All right, this whole book is about staying faithful, right? So he's reminding us that Jesus was faithful. He's not asking us to do something he didn't do. He was, faith, he was faithful despite everything he went through. And, you know, this is where a lot of us lose it. This is honestly where a lot of people have gotten very weak over this, through the pandemic because they have not remained faithful. They have not kept their eyes on Jesus. And so they start getting beat up by the world. And then there's been a ton of social issues and life issues and political issues. And so Christians are getting beat up. They're getting beat up. They're getting dragged into worldliness. They're getting dragged down, and many are falling into sin. Why? Because they've taken their eyes off Jesus, and the, and so this is this is that call to be faithful. Jesus was faithful, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. And of course, Moses is the great hero in Judaism. He's the hero. He's the man in in, in Judaism, and he's look. Jesus was faithful, just like Moses was faithful. And in all God's house, Jesus has been found worthy of, not just was he faithful like Moses, but he's worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house is greater honor than the house itself. So this is obviously a very Judaic argument, a very Jewish argument to, to the Jews who hold Moses in the absolute highest regard. But you say, look, Jesus is even worthy of greater honor for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. You know, he's like, look, remember, Moses went through a lot. I mean, he grew up the prince of Egypt, but he left all that. He suffered out in the desert. He almost died. He went through all kinds of intense things, and he stayed faithful. So that's the example for all of us. But guess what? Jesus is even more faithful. He's, he's been through all that. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. And, okay, you know, and I love this because here's where there's, sometimes the book of Hebrews is conversational. It's almost like he's saying, you know, Christ is faithful, the faithful son over the house. And of course, that's a big deal in, in traditional cultures to be the eldest son that you get, you get it all. You're the inheritor, right? You get everything. And so the son is, he's the boss of the house. And, and, and he says, oh, and by the way, we are his house. <laughs> That's you and me. We're the house. We are the people of God. We are the, the faithful ones of God. But Christ is faithful as, the, as God's house, over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed, and this, is, and this is another little thing just to always do when you're reading scripture. Whenever there's an if, find out 
what is the condition here? What is, if, if begins a conditional phrase, right? If this, then that. That means if not this, then not that. So what's the condition here? What is the condition? If we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So we are his house. We are the family. And, and, and just so you know, in the, in the ancient world, to be a household, to be of someone's household, the oikos, that's a big deal. Like you'll see in the book of Acts, he and his household were baptized, right? Because first of all, the master of the house, the owner of the house, the father of the house, the, the top guy of the house, whatever he does, the whole house does. And that includes everybody. That's, that's the parents, the kids, the servants, the slaves, the animals. I mean, everybody does whatever the master of the house does. And, and that's why you'll see even in the book of Acts, that's so powerful that of when, a, when, a, when the father of a house or the master of a house becomes a Christian, the whole house does because that's the way it works. That was the culture of the time. Not that way today, obviously. <laughs> Whatever you know, one parent does doesn't mean all the kids are doing it. But, but, but that's the way it was. And and he says, you know, we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence, okay, don't give up your confidence. Hang on to that, and the and and, and the hope which ha which we have. And I think that sometimes. You know, one of the tragedies, you can tell when somebody loses hope, they despair, oftentimes they, they get uh, cynical, they, they get resentful, you know, hope deferred, hope that has been lost usually creates bitterness, resentment, you know, and, you, and, you, and we all see it, we've all seen Christians fall into that, where they just become cynical and bitter and resentful, and it's hope deferred, it's because they've lost hope. And the admonition here is hang on to your confidence and hang on to your hope because it comes from Jesus. It doesn't come from the situation. It doesn't come from the world around us. It doesn't even actually come from the church. It comes from Jesus. And anybody who puts their hope in the church is going to be disappointed and disillusioned. It has to come from Jesus. That's who we fix our eyes on, not the church, not people not friends, but on Jesus. So right from the beginning, this is this is just really a great um, pericope, which is a, a, a set of teachings that just help us to understand how to get through this Christian life. You know, and, and even this is useful for even helping somebody who's struggling, you know, that this, what is your confidence in? What is your hope in? It needs to be in Jesus. And, and we have to really be careful because a lot of this can just sound like religious lingo, you know, put your hope in Jesus, praise Jesus, you know, but it's, 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 this is reality. Do you trust his promises? Do you trust what he teaches? If the answer is yes, are you remembering it? Are you fixing yourself on it? Are, are, are you holding on to those promises? Jesus will fix it, right? Somebody should write a song about that. Jesus will heal us. Jesus will heal you. Jesus will get you through this. You have the hope of eternal life. I mean, this. these are wonderful promises. These are life-giving, hope-bringing promises that we have to hang on to. So a lot right there, right at the beginning. And I wanted to camp out there for a few minutes because it's so important. This advice is so important from the Holy Spirit that when we're struggling, and I have found, on first of all, on a personal note, that whenever I'm struggling or I'm down or I'm discouraged or I'm hurt or whatever I'm going through, this is what I have to do. Fix my eyes back on Jesus. And I have, with Michelle and I have also found that whenever we've gone, and this has been kind of our thing in the, in the, in the fellowship, is to turn around churches that was always the most important part, was getting the church to fix their eyes on Jesus again. Getting the group, the Bible talk, the sector, the region, the church, to fix their eyes back on Jesus and grab a hold of the hope and the promises that we have in him. And that's, that's the key. Then he goes into quoting Psalm uh, 95, 7 through 11, 
And, and it's really the introduction of our first, of our second warning. Remember, there was five key warnings in the book of Hebrews. In reality, there are many warnings hidden in there, but 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 the the five biggies, right? And this is this is now we're going into the second one. We already did the first one uh, about not spacing out and 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 not drifting away. Now the second one about making every effort. So he quotes Psalm ninety five, verse seven of Hebrews three. He says, "So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion." During the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did, that, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declare on oath in my anger, oops, accidentally clicked it. Um, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Okay. Beginning of the second warning here, and he's quoting Psalm 95. So he's reminding, he says, look, this is what the Holy Spirit said. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay, this, is, this was obviously a warning to the people of the past. And we all know the story of the rebellion and when they came out of Egypt. And because they did not believe you know, when the prompt, when the spies were sending them, well, first of all, they weren't even supposed to send spies. They were supposed to just march in and take the land. But because of their lack of faith, they wanted to send in spies to make sure it was humanly feasible. And of course, it was not humanly feasible. And the spies came back and reported that, terrified everybody. They lost their faith and were condemned to wander in the desert for 40 years. And that's what happens when you rely on humanistic thinking. You, 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 you get terrified. You, it, it seems like too much. God expects too much. And so the first key, though, he says, do not harden your heart. So the question is, how soft is your heart? And that's, what, that's, that's what the speaker, that's what the author here is questioning with quoting the scripture. You know, what, where's your heart at? And you remember the parable of the sower? The parable of the sower was not said to non-Christians. It was given to God's people to stop and examine our hearts, where our hearts are. Is the word coming in and transforming us? Is the word, as I read it, does it make me more faithful? Does it strengthen me? Does it give me life? Does it heal me? Or is my heart hardened and it just bounces off? You know, later in that chapter, Matthew 13, where the parable of the sower is, is where he talks to them. He said, they will, ever, they will be ever seeing, but never perceiving ever hearing, but never understanding, you know, because their hearts are far from me. This is Jesus was quoting Isaiah and quoting other prophets about how our hearts get hardened. And he said, this is what happened in the rebellion. Their hearts got hardened. The word wasn't, the word of God wasn't penetrating. So the question for us is, do we allow the word of God to penetrate us? When we hear a sermon preached at church, does it change us? And, and, and is our so heart soft enough that the word of God, no matter who the speaker is, whether they're a great speaker or a terrible speaker, is the word of God able to change us? Are we listening to the word of God and reading our Bibles for information only? Or do we allow it for transformation? Do we, do we let it not just inform us, but transform us? That's the, how we should be approaching God's word. But so during the time of testing was where our, your ancestors tested and tried me. Now, the thing, the incredible thing, you know, the, the whole story of Exodus is the story of the Christian life. It's, it's, it's there for us to learn from. You know, when they were set free from Egypt, it's like us getting baptized. But then they had to go through the desert and they had to go through challenges you know, God challenges, God lets us be challenged and he allows us, he rescues us, but then he lets us be tested. I think the last three years in the church has been an incredible time of testing of our resiliency, our faithfulness, our devotion to him. We've been through a lot of difficult times, our world falling apart around us. It's a time of testing. How are we doing? How's the church doing? You know, and, but 
and and we and we test God, you know, that when they got to the end of their desert, when they got to the promised land, they tested God. And he said this, that is why I was angry with that generation. You know, and that that in itself is a big statement here. You mean God gets angry at his people? He could be angry at an entire generation? Yeah, at an entire generation who should have known better, who should have by now trusted God to enter into the promised land and take it. And, and he was very patient because they didn't obey in the first place. They should have just walked in and taken it. They didn't. They wanted to do the whole spy thing. And he even helped them set it up. He told them how to choose the spies and everything. Even though that wasn't really being faithful, God is very patient. He works with our lack of faith. He set up the spies. But then when the spies came back and reported how hard it was going to be, of course, you guys know the story. They lost all faith. And that's what made God angry. I, I, I believe my calling right now in life as a preacher, as a teacher, is to help people understand God's love. Because I think that's one of the greatest deficiencies in our fellowship. For many of us, we just don't understand how loving God is, how what is grace. And we need to grow in that so that we can be confident as we approach God. But that in no way takes away from the fact that sin is evil and destructive and that God can get angry if we refuse, if when we're stubborn. And he's still, we can still make God angry. And I don't want to do that. Um, and I think the greatest motivation, far greater than the fear of God, is the love of God. And that's what we need to grow in as a fellowship. But that doesn't take away a healthy fear of God or understanding that the destruction of sin. And we don't want to, we don't want to frustrate God. We don't want to frustrate the Holy Spirit. He says, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's huge. I mean, that is incredibly big, is that they basically pushed God to the point where they were no longer going to have access to the rest that God promises. So you can actually lose the promises when we're stubborn, when we're prideful, when we refuse to believe, we, we refuse to trust God and never have the promises. It, it, I think of many Christians who, you know, when they became baptized, when they were baptized, they became Christians, they were so excited. Life was changing. Life was good. But as years have gone by, they've let that go. And now they're no longer experiencing the power of God. They're not having victory over sin. Sin is beating them up. Sin has recaptured them. Now they're, they're not living out the promises of God. They don't have life and life to the full. They're in the church. They've been in the church 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And they don't have, they're not full of joy and love and peace and patience and kindness. Actually, they're kind of resentful. They're down. They're getting knocked around by their own sin. Their marriage isn't doing great or any of the above. Their, their family's fighting all the time, whatever. But they're not living the promises of God. They are not entering his rest. They're not receiving the promises. And it's not that God doesn't work or Christianity doesn't work or the church doesn't work or the leadership is no good. I mean, the leadership could still be no good and God could still bless his people because this is between us and God, not between us and church leaders. The le it's not the leadership. It's our relationship with God. It's our focus with him. It's our obedience to him. It's us putting our faith in him. That's the key to all this. And, and, and so this is, this is tragic when, when, when Christians are living, even though they've been set free, they are living as slaves to sin. When Christians, even though they, they should be enjoying the fruits of the spirit, they're not. And they're living without God's rest, which brings us to the next big warning. The next big warning in, in the book of Hebrews. Remember, there's, it, well, we've already started it, but now we're starting to really get into what this warning is about. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters. Okay, there's, there's a command. You got to make sure. You've got to make sure of this. This is not something you want to slip on. You know, this is not one of, something uh, you want to miss. 
you know, the, the, the actual word in the Greek is blepo, which is to, to look at, to watch out, like kind of like alert, 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 you know, keep watching, keep your eyes on this. Watch out this is probably a close translation, um, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, you know, that turns away from the living God. Now, again, there's something really important packed in here that when Jesus came and he taught them to repent for the kingdom of God is near, you know how, how that was kind of the beginning of his ministry, right? That was his message, repent for the kingdom of God is near. That word repent in Hebrew is shuv. It's what I've got over here on the right side. What it literally means is to turn, to return or to turn around. That's what it means. And so repentance is, you know, we, we often think of repentance either, you know, there, well, of course, we are, when most of us are more familiar with metanoia, which is the Greek understanding of repentance. That means to change, like to change your mind. But shuv, the Hebrew understanding, and keep in mind, the Greek is only an attempt to understand the Hebrew. The Hebrew is where these, the principles came out of. When Jesus, Jesus didn't speak in Greek. He spoke in Aramaic, which is closely tied to Hebrew. And that word is shuv, which means turn. So it's turn around because the kingdom of God is here. So he, the, the author here, he's, he's talking to Jews, so he knows. He's telling them, don't turn away. You've turned to God. And that's why you became a Christian. Now don't turn away from God. Keep yourself facing God. Keep yourself turned. And what does turning away mean? It means it, it, that's when you're not believing him anymore. And when you turn away from God, you stop believing, you become sinful, and you get drugged back into the world. So turn back. Basically, this is what with Jesus' message was, turn to God. We translate that in English to repent for the kingdom of God is near. When they asked brothers, what shall we do? In Acts 2, Peter said, turn to God and be baptized. Okay, repent and be baptized. Turn to God and be baptized. And then he tells us, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, and, and remember that word encourage is really important in this book. This is what it calls itself. It's it's the same parakaleo. It's the same word uh, that we're going to see throughout exhort, ex, as an exhortation or encouragement or or a push or you know this is this is that word that key word in the book of Hebrews. Um, so encourage one another daily, daily, every day. And again, I think this is being really tested right now because of the pandemic. We've had a lot of obstacles and that is separating people from the church, separating us from each other. And when any anytime, as you all know, anytime Christians are separated, um, Satan gets in there and tries to discourage, tries to vilify, tries to sow doubt, sow fear. And that's, that's what happens. That's what's happened to a lot of people. And unfortunately, even though we live in the age of communication where you can talk to anybody, we, we, we don't take a whole lot of advantage of that. Like we, we, we have to make sure we are still encouraging each other daily, even though we can't have all the meetings we've had in the past. And some of that just over years is we got busier in life, more kids, more families, more things in life. But some of that, you know, is really intensified over the last couple of years with the pandemic, where we literally couldn't get together. And clearly, Satan has just beat down a lot of people. So this encouragement or this word of exhortation is really important right now in our time in history. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, because this is what will naturally happen when we're isolated, when we're when we're disconnected from the body, our hearts begin to harden. Does it have to happen that way? No, there are some people, I have seen some people thrive during the pandemic. I've seen some people just read a lot, pray a lot, grow spiritually. That's what's happened for me, for sure, because things slowed down. 
which opened the door, allowed me to do a lot more studying and research and, and learning because of my doctorate. I've got, you know, tons of books to read and, and I've been handing out books like crazy. And a lot of people around me have been reading more books and growing. And we've done in Metro, you guys know, we've had a lot of spiritual things to grow. And, and so a lot of people have actually gotten much stronger during the pandemic you know, and make sure that they stay connected, whether it's Zoom, and I know we all get Zoom fatigue, and we all start to hate Zoom, but thank God for Zoom, because it's allowed us to do this, to stay connected, and he says, we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, okay, there's another if there, right, Who's going to get to share in Christ all the way? The ones who hold their original conviction. Is everybody going to do that? No. Remember, many will look, but only a few will find. And unfortunately, that's the way it is. You, as a disciple of Jesus, be the one who holds, who does not let go of the original conviction all the way to the end. And then he goes, he, you know, I mean, Obviously, oh, I, I forgot to tell you that you were just reminded that the word encourage is parakaleo. That's the word we're going to just keep running into again and again and again. Um, but, um, and he goes back to Psalm 95 again. I mean, he's, he's, he's harping on this. This isn't, you know, or she, if it's Aquila, but the, the author is harping on this. Don't let your hearts get hard. As has just been said, he's quoting himself. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Don't do that. Keep your heart soft so that you can change. Keep, make sure you stay that you can be convicted of something. You can be, you can, you can feel remorse. You can feel, you can feel the, the hunger and the thirst for Jesus, for God. Your soul is always hungry and thirsty. When our hearts are hardened, it's we become dull and we're not aware of it. But when our hearts are soft, we feel that hunger. You know, you, you know what that is. You just you can't wait to go and pray. You just like man, you're opening your Bible and you're just like, wow, wow, this is amazing. That's where we need to live and be. But that's we have to protect our hearts because our hearts were hardened. And big time that is happening right now. And, and, and he makes the argument, he, he, he makes another argument, and this, this, the author of Hebrews is using, you know, he's got classic Greek rhetorical argument patterns here. You know, he sets it up, he argues it, he displays it, he, he refers to scripture, he sets up examples. He says, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned and whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Okay, so, you know, he makes the argument that who are we talking about here? We're not just talking about some group of people. We're talking about the people God saved, the people God rescued. And sometimes we take solace and comfort in just the fact that we're members of the church. And we think that that somehow exempts us from being disciplined by God, or that makes it okay to be un unspiritual or unfaithful because we're in the church. And we all know this is human nature, right? Oh, well, I'm fine. I'm in the church. It's those people outside the church. Listen, there can be, you know, I mean, just because we're in the church doesn't mean anything if we're not walking with God. It has no value. It's about our relationship with God. It's about following Jesus. Jesus said, who is my mother, brother, and sister? Whoever does God's will, not whoever is in the church. And we may have to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to confuse membership with discipleship. It's not the same thing. You know, when 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 people say, well, who do you think is going to go to heaven? You think only people in your church are going to heaven? I'll tell them, I don't even think people in my church, everybody in my church is going to heaven. It's a narrow path, and only a few will find it. I, I It's my responsibility to try to get as many people in our church to heaven. That's that's the goal here. But 
but there's no guarantee. And there are a lot of people, according to Jesus, that are going to come to him and, and say, we are with you. And he's going to say, away from me. I never knew you. I don't know you. Knowing Jesus, which is not knowing who he is, it's experiential. It's, it's based on a relationship and experience. That's knowing Jesus. Many will not have that. And he says, who was it that got punished? Who, who missed out on God's rest? The, 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 the katapausis, the rest of God, the, the, the peace that comes from God. It's those who disobeyed. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not just a, you know, I was in rebellion. This is just, I didn't do what he said to do. I didn't believe what he said to believe. I refused. I dug in my heels and I chose not to believe. And that's, that's, that person is not going to enter his rest. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief, just because they didn't believe him. And this really strikes at the heart of what is faith and but also brings up the topic of rest. You know, he's been arguing this, that you're going to miss out on these promises. You're going to miss out. You know, what is he talking, entering what, right? Now, and, and we'll get to the answer to that question, but this brings us right into chapter four, which is, you know, just begins with one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. He says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Okay, first of all, the word in there for being careful is phobeomine. Phobeomine literally means be afraid. Be afraid. What do you need to be afraid of? That you miss God's rest. Think about that. How intense is that? The warning is that it is to not miss his rest. Okay, so of course, begs the question, what does that mean? What, what are you talking about when you're talking about the rest? Well, there's, there's four possible meanings, and I think probably all of them are correct. All of them come into play here. One, he is using it as we would use God's peace, shalom. It is the greatest thing in the world to enter the peace of God. Jesus said, my peace I give you, right? This is his gift to us. That even in this world, even with all the problems we deal with, even with all the struggles we have, even with all the suffering in the world, we can still have peace. We can still rest, find rest in Jesus. He invites us to his light and easy yoke where we will receive rest from him. That's really important for us, especially in these times with so much stress and so much tension in the world. He's using it as he did, number two, he's using it as he did in 3.12 to refer to the promised land, okay, that for the children of Israel who had wandered so long in the desert, the promised land was going to be God's rest, a place where they're not, where they're not so much labor and toil from the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, you know, he takes us to places that are just better for us, right, number three, he's using it from God's rest after the sixth day of creation, when all of God's work was completed, a day of rest, a day that is holy to the Lord, a day that, that we can breathe and rest in the Lord. And that's a whole important study um, and um, of, of being able to rest. Rest is incredibly important uh, for God. And you cannot, many people get burned out and tired as Christians because they do not have, they do, they're not getting the rest of God. They're missing out on the rest of God. And then fourthly, the eschatological, eschatos means the end. So eschatological is a word you'll hear, um, is the study of the end times. So heaven's eternal rest with God. You know, for us, the promised land is heaven, right? That we arrive to heaven. It's not the only promised land. The promised land that we have now is the kingdom of God, where we can live in joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. That is a promise for now. But then the big promise at the end is to be able to be in heaven with God forever. Which of these does he mean? I believe all of them. Uh, they all apply. 
they all apply and they all fit perfectly in what the argument he's making. Phobeomai, be afraid. Don't miss this. Do not miss this. And then he goes, uh, chapter four, uh, continue two through five. Uh, for we have also had good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. You know, bottom line is saying, look, they didn't have faith. They didn't hold on to their faith. You know, faith is such a huge topic. And, and particularly whenever we're going through hard times, the quality of your life depends not on how much money you have, not on how much talent you have, not on how much education you have, not by the friends you have or having the right spouse or none of the, all those things are important, but the most important factor as to the quality of your life is your faith because that's the key and that's the access to the life that God has promised, to this rest, to a life of joy, a life of love, a life of peace, a life of kind, all the things that we all want, everybody, from non-Christian to Christian. The key is faith to achieving and, and, and obtaining those things. And the, the Hebrew word faith, emuna, you see it right there on the right. This is, this is much deeper than our typical uh, English understanding of faith, which we equate it, equate it to believing something. No, no, this, this emuna can be translated to trust, to rely, to be faithful. It can be translated allegiance. Those are all the concepts of what real faith is. You trust in God. Yes, belief is part of it for sure. But it's, you know, as James argues, it's more than just belief. Even the de demons believe in Shudder, but that doesn't save them. It's way more than that. It's trust, reliance, faithful, loyalty. Those are all concepts that are part of faith. And he says, now we who have believed enter the rest, just as God said. So I declare an oath in my anger. And he's going back to Psalm 95 again, you know, reminding us. He's like really pounding on this. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world for, for somewhere. Okay. And, and I love this. He says somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. I love that the author is like, he, do, he doesn't say which citing. And now, does he not say it because he can't remember where it says this or does, or does he not say it to be kind of sarcastic? Like, like earlier I said, somebody should write a song about Jesus can fix it. Right. That I'm being sarcastic. I'm being facetious. Right. I think that's what he's doing. I think he's saying somewhere it's written that, you know, that God spoke about a seventh day, right. About a day of rest. So I, I, I suspect that's what he's doing because well, because the Holy Spirit's here, so I don't think the Holy Spirit forgot where the biblical citation was. Maybe the author forgot and didn't hear the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit said, it's in Genesis 2, too. You know, I don't know. But but I think it's a it's a technique. It's a it's a a technique of how to how to make the argument. And it, and it goes on, he says, and again, the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. And that's 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 the big woe whoa, all those promises of God, all that blessing of being God's people here and now, and then later on in heaven, you lose out on all that. You lose out on all that if you lose your faith. And, and unfortunately, that's happened to a lot of Christians. They've lost out on that because they've lost their faith. And, and you, you, hearer of the book of Hebrews, do not lose your faith. Do not lose your faith. Enter the rest. And of course, God set up the whole system of the seventh day, the day of rest, a day holy to the Lord. Jews, Orthodox Jews still practice this, Shabbat Shalom, a day of resting in the peace of God, a day where you stop your work, you focus on God, you focus on your family, you focus on the blessings of God. And, you know, we... Michelle and I, for our entire ministry life, our ministry career, we've always had a day off, but we only started doing Sabbath about three years ago. And, 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 and it's, not, it's not on the seventh day, it's on Monday, the first day of the week for us. It doesn't matter the day, but the taking a time to stop and rest and just 
count your blessings in God, count your blessings in your marriage, your family, or your children, and be with them, and delight in the Lord, and delight in the family of God. It's a whole other study I don't have time to go into, but incredibly, incredibly important. Um, this is the psalm he keeps quoting. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through it, but you can go back and read it, Psalm 95. It's a psalm of Shabbat. So we're wrapping up here, and there's one last part that I really want to make sure uh, just spend a couple minutes on. Therefore, okay, again, what's it there for? Because of all this, because of everything we're learning here about rest and the promises of God and being faithful, it still remains for some to enter that rest. Some of us need to get to that rest. Some of us need to stop and practice Sabbath. Some of us need to stop and, and count our blessings. Some of us need to go back to being faithful again. We've dropped our faith. We've lost our faith. Our faith is low. It's weak. We, faith can go up and down. And unfortunately, it doesn't show physically. So we've got to learn how to detect it ourselves when we're running low on faith. And, and he says, therefore, some of you get back to that rest. And since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, because those people lost out on their rest, God again set a certain day, calling it today, not the past, not history, today, not the future, today. This he did when a long time later, he spoke through David as in the passage already quoted. And here he goes back again, the Psalm 95. I mean, you talk about repetition. I mean, when, when I was first you know, working on this in transit, I was like, dang, this is like the fourth time he makes the exact same point. He is not letting up on this. Clearly, he wants us to get it, you know? I mean, they say, they, they say whoever they are, that people only retain 10% of what you say. So if you really want people to hear something, you got to say it 10 times. Well, that's basically what he's doing. He's just saying it again and again and again to make sure we get it. And since there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, Okay, there's still another rest out there for us. We haven't gotten it all yet. There's still more out there. You know, this is he's kind of like saying, but wait, there's more. You know, he's 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 letting us know there's more for us. For anyone who enters God's rest, also rests from their works. You know, the it's a physical rest, it's spiritual rest, it's an emotional rest, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort, do everything you can to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following, well, let me move the thing, my little things in a way, if you can't see it, by following their example of disobedience. I mean, you know, if, if, if who would have ever thought that if God started a sentence saying, be afraid, that that would be followed by of missing God's rest. I mean, that's, wait, be afraid of not resting? Really? Yeah, really. Because this is the promise of God because this is the blessing. And you, if you're not resting in the Lord, you're going to lose out on everything. You're going to lose out on all the promises because faith, Sabbath rest is absolutely a product of faith. They are tied together. Remember, they didn't trust God and they tried to collect extra manna to, 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 to and, and God made the manna spoil so that they couldn't collect more than what the, he was teaching them to live by faith. And he says, don't, don't lose out on that. And here's the last part that, uh, and we know this scripture well, well, right? For the word of God, this is Hebrews 12, 4, and we're now in verse 12, 13. The word of God is alive and active. And I know it from the old, the, I think the 84 NIV, living and active, right? Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm running out of time, so I, I, got, I can only just point out the words here. But living, alive, and active, the, the, the word is soe, life, active, energy, where we get the word energy from, energes. So the word of God, it's alive. And not the word it's using is not bios. Bios is life. That's bios, life. Trees have bios. A lizard has bios. Humans have bios. Jesus said, I have come to give Zoe. That's meaningful life, life of purpose, life of love, life of, 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 of significance. It's, it's the life that we all want, right? That life to the full. The word of God, this is what it brings. Life, Zoe, and energy or power is another way to think of it. 
So the, the word of God can, can give us what we really want and give us and, and the power to get there, the power to arrive there and to have all those promises of God. And, and, and then he says, you know, about a divide soul and spirit, psuche and neuma, soul and spirit, joints and marrows, melo, me, muelon and harmon. It, it, it's just making the point that it goes deep. It will transform you. It will change you from the inside out. We all know this. When we did the studies, we were radically changed, right? And we've seen it happen dozens of times when we teach people the Bible. We see their lives change, not from the outside in. They don't just change different. They don't change their language and their clothing only. That happens because of the change on the inside, right? And he says the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, right? So, so those are three categories. What? Spirit, body, mind, and heart. Your soul, your mind, and heart. So what are we supposed to love God with? Our all our mind and heart, body and spirit, our soul, right? This is, this is he's definitely connecting the, the whole self. This is what holistic Christianity is. Mind, body, heart, and soul or spirit. It's all of it. And the word of God will help us with all of it. And so I, I wish we had more time to really just even pull out more of what's in here, but this gives you a good idea of how rich scripture can be and how much meaning and there's there's so much in every little word what is your soul what is your spirit why does it mean by joints and marrow and your thoughts and your heart and how that ties into the shema the the greatest commandment to love god with all your heart mind soul and strength and then he says i keep having to move this thing around so it doesn't block oh this is a quote that i just love um i think uh i think it kind of illustrates what's happening here he says, this is Richard Foster, one of the great writers of the 20th century, uh, spiritual leaders, still alive, still writing. He says, we have not achieved a grasp of the Bible that is adequate to our needs. And I think this, this kind of illustrates why it's so important that we take the time to dig in, that we take the time to get into this and pull out these gems and why, why it's important that we have teachers in the church who can do this. Not everybody needs to learn Greek and Hebrew, but somebody in the room Somebody in the church needs to be able to put, mine this out and bring these gems and gold and silver jewels out and show and, and so they can bless all of us. And we need to be the people who are always in the book with a deep grasp of it so that we can have the power of God in our lives, so that we can have the rest of God in our lives. Too many people, I think, are skimming their Bibles or not reading their Bibles much, and they're not achieving they're not, they don't have an sufficient grasp of scripture to meet the needs of their lives. And they're, so they're getting overwhelmed by sin, overwhelmed by the problems of the world, getting tossed back and forth and living as victims instead of as victors. Uh, Ronald Rollheiser, um, another great theologian right now, uh, he said, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. We're so distracted. We have so many things happening in our lives. Our phones are bombarding us with information. And media is just constantly surrounding us. So we're just distracted. We learn to survive by scan skimming things, by not reading too much, by not focusing too much. Our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and remarkably generation to generation. Ruth Haley Barton said, to walk without rushing, to eat without gulping, and to pray without looking at our watches. And I add to that, to read without looking at our phones, to be in a class without multitasking, you know, to be able to just sit and listen to God's word. Phobe oh my, beware, be afraid. Don't let yourself be distracted into oblivion. So we close out, here's, here's the end. And this really isn't part of that, this really kind of wraps up the first couple of chapters and sets us up for the next chat couple. And this will be what John Oakes covers. But I do want to just point out one thing. And this is how he ends that argument. He says, therefore, again, because of everything we just covered, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I mean, what, what a powerful conclusion to all this. And he's actually setting up chapters five and six. They're going to talk a lot about Jesus, the high priest. Well, it's actually the next four chapters. But he, he, he wraps up of who are we talking about here? Who is Jesus? He's the one who can empathize. And he's through the script, through these chapters, he's shown us how Jesus is empathy. What is empathy? They can feel someone who can feel your pain with you. They can show empathy. They can, they, because they have empathy, they feel your pain. We have the modern phrase, are you feeling me? Can you feel me? That's empathy. Sympathy, to understand your pain. Jesus understands your He shares your pain. He cried when he saw Mary and Martha. He cried over the city of Jerusalem. He feels your pain. He has sympathy. He understands your pain because he's been tempted in every way, because he lived like us. He has compassion. What's compassion? To will to relieve your pain, to help you with what you are suffering. He has that. He's the Lord of compassion. He is the Lord of mercy. What is that? To treat you with, with, with regard to your pain. Because you are pain, because, in pain, because you are suffering, because you're going through hard times, he will show mercy. That's Jesus, the Lord, God of empathy, sympathy, compassion, and mercy. That's who we're talking about. So that's, that's kind of how he wraps up these chapters um, and sets us up for the next argument of who Jesus is is so i'm gonna stop the sharing there and um i'm gonna end the uh